if I can live up to that. That was pretty good. <laughs> if you're visiting here, it's kind of an unusual title, I know, Cave People. Uh, it's a series of messages from the Bible where we're looking at actual people's lives that brought them to the place where they were in caves for various reasons. Uh, many times you'll see it was because of extreme circumstances. Today's a special day. We're, uh, we're baptizing people. We, I don't know, what, whatever we baptize, nine or something like that in the first service, and I think we have 19 in this service. Um, anyway, I, I want to kind of direct some of my talk to the baptismal people. Now, however, I'm talking to everyone, but kind of toward them. Picture this, if you would. Now, some of you that are being baptized, I know you have actually probably made your decision to put your trust in Christ and become his follower many years back, and you delayed being baptized for all different kinds of reasons. But let's just suppose you had just made your decision. And by the way, for some of you that might be here visiting, the, the definition of a Christian, how one becomes a Christian, is one puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has proven himself trustworthy to us by creating the universe and then suffering and dying on the cross to show the depths of his sacrificial love for us even though we break his heart with the way we break our own lives by sin. So he's proven himself trustworthy, creation of the universe and sacrificial love, and when his revelation of himself wins my trust and I decide, let the rest of the world do what it wants, follow who it wants, but I'm putting my trust in Christ, in Jesus. He rose from the dead, I'm going to trust him, I'm going to follow him. When a person makes that decision to say, let everybody else follow whoever they want, um, maybe most of us follow ourselves through most of our life, but I'm going to put my trust in Jesus and follow him, then that's when a person becomes a Christian, a real Christian. And, and when that happens, their, their old life has a break point. The scripture teaches that baptism symbolizes this. It symbolizes the burial of, of the person's old self, the way they used to live, and then we bring them up out of the water because we don't want to kill them, so we, we bring them up out. <laughs> and uh, that symbolizes, according to Romans chapter 6, that they're now going to live a new life as a new person that doesn't follow their own desires, their own ideas about life, or society's ideas or desires, but they're going to follow Christ. They're going to build their life on the revelation of God's will as it's given to us in his word. So all that's involved in what you're going to see here today. But let's just suppose, so you put your trust in Christ and become his follower. And maybe some of you will do that even this day. I did that back at age 23. I hope someone here that's never done that might do that today. But nevertheless, you put your trust in Christ and all of a sudden, man, your life just starts to hit full stride. Everything seems to be going your way. The ball is always bouncing the way you want it. You immediately, you're immersed in a group of people that like you, support you. You get this breakthrough job, big time government job. A big time government official takes notice of you, gives you this high rolling job. And the next thing you know, you, you go from being a nobody to almost celebrity status, man. You're like on the news and everything and you've got to pinch yourself and you're like, man, God is good. In one year, your life has been completely revolutionized and you're like, thank you, Lord. But then something happens. That person that took a liking to you initially, the one that gave you the, the high position, that person starts to not like you so much. They find out that you're a fully devoted follower of Christ and that makes them uncomfortable and the more they're around you and they hear your views the less comfortable they are until finally they decide they don't like you at all and they're going to do something about it they're going to first try to take subtle measures to nullify you and maybe get you fired by someone else and then when that doesn't work they get so in inflamed against you they decide they're going to set you up for legal issues. They, they want to see you not just lose your job. They want to see you go to jail. Now, mind you, you haven't done anything. You're just being the same old, ordinary, Christ-following person. You've had one year of meteoric rise. Now, all of a sudden, this enemy comes out of nowhere. And it gets so bad, so bad, that you are being charged with things. And you realize this is really serious. I, I could do life imprisonment for this and you know that you've done nothing wrong so now you face a really difficult decision in fact I'm going to do something I didn't do in the first service I'm going to ask you this so you know you're being charged unjustly you know you may face life in jail for the rest of your life and you have a decision to make you're either going to run you're going to go on the run you're going to become a, a you know a refugee for justice or you're going to take your chances in court how many would say I'm going on the run can I see your hands 
You're all afraid, aren't you? I'm running, man. <laughs> I'm going running. They're going to catch me. If I'm not guilty, you're going to have to catch me. <laughs> so what I've just described to you, in fact, let me go one step further. Let's say you do decide to go on the run. Some of us would. I would. <laughs> you go on the run, and this thing, this nightmare of being a refugee from justice, it, it lasts for three years. And at one point, it gets so bad. You're, you're so desperate. You're so scared. You literally are forced one night to spend the night in an abandoned cave just to try to survive one more 24-hour period so you can hit the road again tomorrow and run. And you spend the night in the cave just to survive. And yet, you think to yourself, how can this happen? I, I'm a Christian. I, I mean, it was about a year ago. I put my trust in Christ. I was baptized before an audience of people letting them know that let the rest of the world follow who it wants. I'm going to follow Jesus. And here I am in this cave, unjust charges. My whole life is, is perhaps ruined. And nobody seems to care. Nobody's helping me. Where, God, where are you? What does this mean? What's going on? I just described to you in detail an actual character in scripture and what happened to that character the character's name is David there's more written about David than anybody else in scripture except for the Lord Jesus Christ David is the second king of Israel he's the greatest king of Israel he's the writer of most of the psalms that we have in our old testament and what happened or what I just described is what happened to David. Let me go back really quick, and I'm going to condense it down. David is just a shepherd boy. He's minding his sheep, but he's a loyal follower of God. Samuel the prophet comes to him and says, the Lord has rejected Saul, the first king of Israel, as king, and God wants you to be king. Samuel looks at all of his brothers, and the Spirit of God keeps saying, no, not him, not him, not him, the young one, him. So David gets oil dumped over his head because that was symbolic of the spirit of God was going to give him the ability he needed to lead the people of God so Samuel makes him the king he's a shepherd nobody knows about him but he's anointed as king well within a short period of time King Saul the real king he starts having these depressive bouts uh, demonically induced depressive bouts and so the people around him say man let's get some music around this guy something to call him, calm him down so David happens to be a good musician they bring David from the, the shepherd flock into the king's court and he's playing his harp and Saul gets mellow and so he, David's got to be thinking to himself how about that they anointed me as king and here I am in just a short time I'm right in the king's court well then he goes back home he shepherds his flock again and then all of a sudden there's a big battle the Philistines they're, they're you know, getting ready to attack the Israelites and then they say wait 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 wait, wait. Let, let's, not, let's not have a slaughter here you get your best guy and we'll get our best guy and let those two fight and then you know whoever wins will be your servants and you know the story this big guy is with the Philistines Goliath he's nine foot six and he challenges and humiliates the Israelites every day for 40 days by the way he was the remains of the Nephilim David ends up getting rid of all the Nephilim in his lifetime but anyway some of you know what I'm talking about Nephilim anyway so David happens to be delivering some food to his brothers and he hears this this giant popping off and he says man give me a break why isn't somebody killing this guy he, he's defying the Lord and so David says look 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 I was out in the field watching the sheep and this bear came along and and I slaughtered the bear because the Lord enabled me and then another time I was out in the field a lion came along and I slaughtered the lion because the Lord enabled me this Philistine will be to me just like that because he's defying the Lord and you know the story he gets his sling don't think sling like this how many of you when you were a kid you had this kind of sling you pulled it back on that rubber band that's not what David had they had a big bad weapon they had a rock about the size of a major league hardball and this thing has a long piece of leather and they swung it like this and that thing would get about 100 miles an hour and it was a real military weapon that's what he killed Goliath with so all of a sudden in less than a year 930 BC this thing starts Samuel anoints him 929 he kills Goliath and he's brought into the king's court the king's son Jonathan takes him in as his best friend and then before you know it Saul the king starts becoming jealous of him because the people are singing in the streets Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his tens of thousands and so Saul starts getting scared 
about his own security. So he figures, okay, I'm going to get rid of this guy, but I'm going to do it subtly. I'm going to send him out to fight the Philistines, and he'll get himself killed. I know he will. Well, David goes out, and he just keeps winning. No matter where God or Saul sends him, he wins. So Saul decides, I've got to get more serious. I'm going, I'm going to execute this guy. I'm going to make him out to be a bad guy, an enemy. Saul tries to pin him to the wall with javelins on a couple occasions, at that point, David realizes, even though I'm married to the king's daughter, and he was, I've got to go on the run. If I stay here, I'm not going to make it. So one year from nobody to hero, and then from hero, married to the king's daughter, to on the run. And he stays on the run, a fugitive for the next three years. That's where we get to today's message. The day, today's message is called this. The cave of desperation and destiny. And I know that sounds contradictory. He's in a cave. We're going to find David in a cave on the run. But that cave that brought him to a place of desperation, mark this in your minds or on your program, you can read about his desperation in Psalm 142. He wrote Psalm 142 about his experience in the cave. And he was broken and discouraged and scared and um, almost depressed, you'd have to say, but that cave of desperation became actually the cave that launched him toward his actual destiny. Mind you, he was already God's king. He just wasn't the king in the political sense yet because Saul was still alive. All right, let's go on. Here we go into our text. 1 Samuel chapter 22, it says, So David left Gath, that was the bastion of the Philistines, kind of their capital. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. There's our cave the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Now pause for a minute. Again, read Psalm 142 on your own. David is in this cave. He is terrified. He's a broken man. He's got nothing left. He's probably going through that ride mentally that you and I would be going through. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, man. I, I don't get it. God, where are you? Why would you let this happen to me? Why would you exalt me only to bring me down so low? He might have been thinking to himself, man, I wish Samuel the prophet would have never came to my house or I wish he, would have, wish he would have tapped one of my brothers instead of me. He might have thought to himself, God, if this is what you do to your loyal servants, what, what does this mean? I, I don't understand what you're doing here. So he's got all these kinds of thoughts going through his mind. So he's just trying to survive, okay? When you're in a cave hiding, you're just trying to make it another 24 hours. But then it says soon his brothers and all his relatives joined him there. Now, you got to think this one through. Saul, the king that was the king at that time, he had just weeks before killed 85, 85 loyal priests of God. The reason he killed these 85 priests, they gave one meal to David. David was on the run, and he was starved out. And these priests gave, gave him one meal. When King Saul came, he killed 85 of them. I'm saying all that to say this. If you're his relatives, and you gather to David you're putting your life on the line you're 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 going to be executed if king saul can get to you nevertheless nevertheless his family starts to gather to him they find him in this obscure place hiding hoping to hang on to a thread of life look at what else happens then others others begin coming men who are now listen to this description of the people that came to david others begin coming men who were you tell me what's the word we're in what trouble and what dead and who were what? How many of you would fit into that category? <laughs> at least one out of three? Come on, own up. Confession is good for the soul. Maybe at least in debt. We're Americans. You know you're in debt. <laughs> but what a ragtag bunch. Uh, they, were, they were in trouble. They were in debt. Or they were just malcontents. They were just discontented with things. These people keep coming to David until David was the captain of this ragtag bunch, the captain of 400 men. So this was his experience in this, this cave of Adullam. Now, I want to turn the corner for where we're really going in this message because I want you to think about something because here, here, here's what I know about life. I've been around the sun a lot of times. I don't know how many times you've been around the sun. I've been around a lot. Do you know that, that, that every year you go around the sun? How many knew that? It's a little science fact that I'm giving you today. <laughs> <laughs> you are likely to spend some time in the cave of Adullam. 
If you're a child of God, if you've put your trust in Christ and become his follower, you are more likely to spend some time in the cave Adullam. I mean it spiritually speaking. I mean in that place where you feel like, I don't have anything left, man. I'm, I'm like hanging on by a thread. My life is out of control. It's confusing. It's thinking hurts to be me. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I've done. I don't know where this is all leading to. I'm trying to walk with God, but, but everything seems to have been dumped upside down, and I don't understand it. You're likely, if you're a child of God, to spend some time in the cave of Adullam. And, and so it's wise for us to understand the dynamics, uh, the why behind the what. The what is the terrible feelings we have when we're there, where we feel like we're just hanging, man, hanging by a thread. But, but the, the what behind it, or the why behind it, can be very valuable. So that's what I want to unpack. Here we go. Might, might desperation be the doorway to necessary, and what is the word? Development. Mind you, a year earlier, oil is dumped on David's head, which meant you're God's chosen king. But he wasn't functioning as a king yet. He was on the run. And the truth be told, he wasn't really equipped to function as a king. He, had no, he didn't have the right experience. He had dormant capacities, just like you and I have dormant capacities, that God needed to arouse, needed to stir through some means before we could, or he could, develop the skills that he was going to need to fulfill the destiny that God had for him. Can somebody hear what I'm saying? God's got a destiny for each of us in here. There's a general overarching destiny. You'll see that when I get to a verse here in a minute. But there's a specific destiny too. Um, my destiny in this life is not the same as yours. Yours is not the same as mine. You are given a set of gifts, spiritual gifts, regular talents, some, some time, some experiences, some life learnings. And then God's going to put you in a certain context, a certain environment, and he is not going to expect of you what he expects of me, nor is he going to expect of me what he expects of you. But but you have this unique God-given destiny. You don't have to be somebody else. You just have to be you. But to do that, we all need some development. Might the desperation, might desperation be the doorway necessary for development? The desperation that David felt is it possible that that's the, the spiritual, mental uh, energy that he needed to grow, to develop, to get some experiences under his belt that would allow him to be the man, the woman, I'm talking to you guys now, in his case, a man, that God intended him to be. Let me show you some scripture to support this. Romans chapter 5 of the New Testament is writing to followers of Christ. It says, we can rejoice too, when we run into what does it say problems and what's the next word so 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 paul's telling christians you know we we have this capacity we have this ability to rejoice even when we run into problems and trials why why why, paul for we know we know they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of what's the word character character god really cares about our character now let's be frank parents we all to some measure care about the character of our children but a lot of times if we're honest we let our emotions get out in front of our cognitive reasoning and 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 we'll yield we'll give in to things because you know they want something and we know they really want it but but we'll give them what they want rather than what they need god's not like that (laughs) he's really patient he'll he'll win the battle because he cares about our character because character is going to going to determine what the quality of our life is so he says we we know it brings strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation in other words it's saying that we'll know we're the real deal we're we're followers of god we love god we love righteousness for its own intrinsic worth we're we're not just riding this thing to hope that our elevator goes up at the end of life and doesn't go down no 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 we we trust christ we love him we love his kingdom and his righteousness and we're following him because he has won the desires of our heart let me take you to another one and this is the really important one i've been wanting to get you to Remember, we're talking about how this cave of desperation can provide a context for development, for for growth, character growth. For a short time, 
our fathers disciplined us as they thought best. How many of you had some fathers that disciplined you as they thought best, but you didn't think it was best? Can I see your hands? Yeah, I didn't even have one. I didn't have one. I was raised by wolves. Oh! <laughs> For a short time, our fathers disciplined us as they thought best, not as we thought best, yet God disciplines us for our what does it say our own good whoa wait a minute you mean God's never going to tell me something unless he knows ultimately it's for my good that's what it's saying you mean God's never going to tell me to stop doing something unless he knows it's ultimately for my good that he doesn't want to just spoil my fun and box me in and deprive me no it's only for our good it goes on it says more he disciplines us for our own good so that so that we can become what holy like what like two big lessons in this life folks that every human being is meant to learn lesson number one we are meant to learn to live the way god himself lives okay to become like him second lesson we're meant to learn to love the way that god himself loves when we live the way that God lives when we love the way that God loves and this is a progressive thing you know we're taking miniature steps and sometimes it's one step forward and three back but as we're growing in this way we are becoming truly human fully human and fully alive in the way that God created us to be we're becoming the kind of beings that he intended in in the original and you're going to find and I know that most of you here you know this every little incremental step of growth we make in that direction where we're really starting to live the way God himself lives and we're starting to love the way he loves it starts to feel better just to be us it brings clarity it brings objectivity it brings harmony it brings self-control it it produces this desire to give instead of take and and get all the time So, so good things this discipline of God that develops our character let me go on here's the dark side of this thing of God's discipline we don't enjoy being disciplined (laughs) it always seems to cause more pain than joy but listen but what does it say later later see we're we're all about immediate gratification i mean sin is usually revolves around immediate gratification i get what i want how i want when i want it and i and it makes me feel good for the moment but usually it is followed by consequences in the long run god's way is usually just the opposite that's why jesus called called it, jesus called it the narrow way it usually means i have to not gratify my immediate desires but in the long run it develops me and I become a different kind of person and I experience life on a different level a different quality we don't enjoy being disciplined it always seems to cause more pain than joy but later on those who learn from that discipline have peace that comes from doing what what does it say from doing what is right there's just right and wrong there's just the way God designed things and the way that he didn't design things I mean I can take this guitar over here and um, I can use it, you know, to just smash everything up here. I could use it as a baseball bat. <laughs> and it would work as a baseball bat. <laughs> but it wouldn't be the way it was designed. It's not what it's designed for. That, that, that's all God's trying to get us to do. He lovingly wants us to accept his discipline so that we can learn to live the way we were designed to live. Let me take you to one more. Romans 8 29 now this is the overarching uh, goal of God's character development plan for we humans he says for those God foreknew meaning that God looked down through the tunnel of time before he ever created an angel before he ever created a image bearing being angel or human he looked down and and he knew that if I give beings the capacity to enjoy life the way I myself enjoy it mind reason emotions free will if I give that many of them are going to misuse it he foresaw before he created any angel he foresaw one third of them would rebel and bring evil into existence in the universe he foresaw that the human family would all betray him break trust with him but he also saw that many of the human family if God were willing to sacrificially reveal himself meaning Christ on the cross we could be won back he could win back our trust trust so God foreknew those who could be reached if you're here today and you've put your trust in Christ God's known you from all eternity before you ever came into existence he didn't pre-program you you have free will authentic free will but he did know for those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of who yes so you were destined i was destined you were 
destined to be a stunningly beautiful human being. You were destined to look just like Jesus. There is no model on the planet in human history of a life that's anywhere even near, even remotely near the beauty of Jesus. You, I, we were meant. We have that capacity. The capacities are dormant. Only God knows how to awaken them so that they can grow and develop. But we have a, a, a spiritual DNA in us to become like Christ. That was always God's plan. So this, this cave of desperation can actually be a place where, where deep development takes place. For example, if David was going to be the king, God anointed him as king, you know, a year earlier. Um, kings need some qualities. And I just randomly listed a few real quick. Uh, for example, a king would have to have great devotion to the Lord as well as to the people he was serving. A king would have to be decisive. He'd have to have drive, you know, self-starter energy. He'd have to have daring. You've got to make some tough decisions. Determination, lots of reasons to get discouraged and quit. Decency, by decency, I mean a king would have to be someone that authentically from the heart respects every human being that he ever meets. Discernment, king would have to know how to read circumstances and read people, that, that takes time. Dependability, that people would have to know you can always trust the king to do the right thing, to be faithful. Now, if you just took this list and you read it every day, would those qualities automatically penetrate and you would become like that? The answer is no. You could memorize them. You could want to be like that, but you won't be. I won't be. It would help. No, these things, they happen in the, the grit and the grime and the movement of real life in real time. What I'm trying to say is, as Christians, we tend to isolate God's methodology for how he develops us. We, we, we tend to say, okay, well, if you want to grow as a Christian, come on, we can all rattle them off. You got to read that Bible. And you do. You got, you got to study your Bible. And you got to pray. And you got to give, and you got to serve, and you got to surround yourself with brothers and sisters in Christ and encourage you. All these things are true. All these things are good. But frankly, they have a, an impact, a, a shaping, a character shaping impact, but it's not nearly as big as we make it to be in church world. You know where most of your character formation, your Christ like character formation, is going to take place, or at least has the greatest likelihood of taking place? Let me, let me just give you an example. How many in here have ever had a job in your life that you either hated the job or you hated the people? I know you're not supposed to hate people, but for today we can hate them. You either hated the job or you hated the people. Can I just see your hands? Uh-huh, the cave. That's where the perfect context is for you and I to develop Christ-like character. Because when you're in that circumstance, think about it, you have to develop patience, you have to develop tenacity, you have to develop mercy, forgiveness, all, all these things. And, and the pressure against causes you to push out and that's how we actually grow. We need to learn to read our circumstances better. David's in the cave, he can't figure why he's in the cave, but he's in the cave because God knows he's not ready to be a king yet. He's gotta develop some kingly traits and those kingly traits are only gonna happen in a real Real life context where everything in him wants to do the opposite but he's forced to do the other all of a sudden he's just hiding out trying to survive but all these people come to him needing help so now he's got to help them when he feels like he can't help himself so the cave of desperation it really is a place of opportunity opportunity to get close to God in ways we never would before when we, when we have other things to distract us an opportunity to start that process of becoming that unique person that God intended us to be and doing that unique set of things he intends us to do secondly my treatment my treatment of the desperate be the determinant of destiny what am I talking about here remember David's in the cave and then he looks out and he's like oh shoot man I thought I was all alone I'm just trying to survive and here comes these people and I know they got their hands out they want help that's family they have family always wants help I know that and then he's got all these other people the troubled the in debt the discontented so now David could have thought to himself listen guys I, I, I'm sorry I'm all out of juice I don't have anything for you I'm just barely surviving it's taking everything I have just to to get my breath for one more day but no that's not what he does he takes them under wing. He gives them what he does not have. I'm, I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute. The, might the treatment of the desperate be the determinant of destiny? Because David takes them under wing, because he serves them and he organizes them and he protects them and he directs them, 
Because of that, he starts to grow and he starts to expand the potential for his future. You can't be a king unless you can give a king's life, a good king's life, a good leader's life. Let me bring it down to us. A good mom, a good dad, a good friend, a good boss, a good employee or employer is somebody that has a growing capacity to give and to serve, not to take and to use. And that means we got to be in situations where we have to give before we have anything to give. Let me go on and I'll, I'll unpack that better. Matthew 9, Jesus looking at a multitude of people. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Jesus is saying these people are reachable. They, they just look tired and confused and chaotic and, and out of control but, but the truth is they're, they're reachable if people just had the willingness to invest in them is what Jesus is saying to his followers let me go on <clears throat> Jeremiah three fifteen, the Lord speaking he says <clears throat> then I will give you shepherds those that care for you oversee guide direct protect I will give you shepherds who trust and know me wise teachers who will impart knowledge and understanding to you God wants his people cared for shepherded guided directed built up let me go again Matthew 20 Jesus called the apostles and he said you know the rulers of the nations have absolute power over people and their officials have absolute authority over people but that's not the way it's going to be among you whoever wants to become what is the word great there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great but whoever wants to become great among you will be your, what is the word? Well, we know that, don't we? How many of you in here have ever had a baby? You know, I mean, men, you know, you know what I'm saying. But, but you, had a, you had a child, you had a baby. Can I see your hands, baby? Okay. Were you bigger than that baby when that baby was born? Okay. Were you, were you smarter than that baby? <laughs> could you do things that baby could never do? then why didn't you get that baby to serve you? You're the big dog. <laughs> but we know better. No, 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 no. Greatness is always the same. Greatness is the desire and the capacity to give whatever I can to you, to help you, to bless you, to build you. Uh, I don't need anything back from you. I'm getting what I need from God. I just want to help you. I want to give something to you. That's the mark of greatness. Greatness. These people come to David. David has nothing, nothing to give. Many of you, you feel like, man, I'm, I'm maxed out, Randy. I, 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 my schedule, I'm maxed out. I don't have any time left. I don't have any margin. I don't have any emotional energy left. I'm maxed out. I have nothing to give. And God keeps sending people into my life that need stuff. Yes, he will. Because he wants to awaken capacities in you that you don't even know about, capacities to give beyond what you can even imagine and when you start to do that you become someone different and man you become a great person you become great David rise, rose up to the occasion and he gave let me just say a little secret these 400 that gathered around him they became the start of David's mighty army three of them became what he calls three of his mighty men later on in his kingdom reign he writes a list of of 30 of these guys that were these outstanding servants and heroes that stood by him through thick and thin and three of them three of them when he met them <laughs> they were in trouble they were in debt and they were discontented and they wanted something from David that he didn't have but he gave it to them anyway you say Randy what are you talking about how do you give what you don't have Remember when Jesus was, was with the multitudes, 5,000, and he tells his disciples, he says, go ahead and feed them, guys. I, I'm going to go sit down for a minute. And they're like, feed them? What are you talking about? It's 5,000 men, not to mention the women and the children. He says, yeah, 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 take care of it. You can feed them. But, but Lord, we, we got like five loaves and two fish. That'll work. That'll work. First, give it to me. So they give their lunch. They gave what they didn't have to Christ for others. And you know the story. He multiplies it. Not only does all the 5,000 get fed, but 12 baskets full are collected up. So the disciples, you've got to hear this one. The disciples started out with nothing. They had nothing to give. Some of you feel like you have nothing to give. There's no margin. And I am here to tell you, 
God has given you the capacity to give so much more than you understand. And as you give what you don't have for others that God brings into your life, the desperate, the needy, the hurting, the confused, the shepherdless, as you give to them, not only will you supply them, you will be filled with a supply that you didn't even know was possible. And you'll start to become beautiful, beautiful people, strong people, beautiful people, people impervious to the changes of life people that the beauty and the glory of Christ is manifest in and through more and more let me close really quickly because we got a lot of people to dunk <laughs> by the way don't open your mouth when I take you under <laughs> you might be in the cave this morning walk out knowing this God was with David in the cave he loved David just as much in the cave it was the place where he was developing David you might be in the cave. It's not the end of your story. Don't be thinking that crazy stuff. My best days are behind me. No, 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 no. Your best days are all ahead of you. The cave is the place where the beautiful you is about to start to develop if you'll walk through that cave clinging to God and His will. Secondly, some of you, maybe all of us, we've got too many hands out, too many people that want our help, too many people that want our attention. We feel like, man, I don't have it. I don't have the capacity serve those people that God puts across your path and your capacity will grow and what you can't do you'll be able to do and you'll do it easy and you'll do it better and better and better and blessing will flow out of your life and everybody that knows you will count themselves blessed because they knew you I, I think you all want that somewhere deep inside pray with me and then we're going to baptize Father we just thank you for this unspeakably good day Man, it is so good. So good to belong to you and just to be a small part of the beautiful things you do in lives. We thank you for the lives that are going to stand here this morning and declare they have died to their old life and they're going to live forevermore for you because they trust you. Uh, I pray that this will be such a special experience for them. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.